Thank you all, and uh, it's it's great to be back uh, with you tonight. Uh, apologetic that it took so long to get part two uh, 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 to you, uh, but I hope that uh, you will enjoy uh, what I would consider a uh, fairly basic primer on some core concepts in biostatistics and epidemiology. Obviously, these are uh, areas of science that people spend their entire life uh, working to understand and to utilize to help us to better understand not only infectious diseases but so man many other studies and areas of medicine of, you know, of importance to our patients. Um, as uh, we have a, a smaller group tonight, I'm going to uh, certainly want to have this be informal. If you have a question, please feel free to uh, to stop me and uh, we can uh, go through and try and make sure that there's clarity uh, on these concepts for you. Um, and it will also leave question uh, time at the end uh, for questions as well. When we uh, met last in part one, uh, our agenda was, as noted in the first half of this slide, that is, we talked about definitions and concepts of measurement, uh, the basics of descriptive statistics, and then talked uh, specifically about uh, hypothesis testing, uh, particularly as it related to two types of uh, uh, basic tests, uh, chi-squared tests and t-tests. Uh, what I'd like to do tonight is to go through very briefly uh, the, uh, the latter two tests, chi-square and t-test, uh, so that you can review that uh, very importantly before heading on to the uh, majority of our time, which will be spent in part two on doing analysis of variance, correlations, interpretations of some basic epidemiologic data such as sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, and then odds ratios and relative risks. Again, as a reminder, uh, there are two main types of variables. Qualitative variables, sometimes called in categories or groups or nominal uh, categories. Uh, they are analyzed by examining frequency tables uh, such as we used in part one. We also have uh, quantitative variables uh, which are numeric, continuous, or scale variables uh, analyzed by examining central tendencies. So this uh, slide uh, probably sums up best what we're going to cover tonight. Again, the first two categories very briefly just by way of review with one example each of what a chi-square test is and a t-test and then we'll spend the majority of our time on uh, the ANOVA, the correlations, and then some epidemiological concepts. So when do you use a chi-square test? Well chi-square is used when you're comparing two qualitative or categorical variables. So it examines the relationship uh, or differences, if they exist, between two uh, categorical variables uh, through cross-tabulations of those uh, variables. Usually one variable is referred to as the independent variable and is put in columns. The other variable will be uh, called the dependent variable and usually is in rows. That's just by convention uh, that you will see in the in the literature when you look at uh, cross tabs types of chi-square presentations. Here is one of those uh, cross tabulations. In this case, uh, we're going to be interested in seeing whether or not there is a relationship between gender, which again is categorical male-female, uh, and whether that has an effect on cholesterol status. And in this case, we're looking at the, the last column, the cholesterol, as high or normal. That's why this is categorical. It's not continuous. Using those two categorical variables, again, uh, here in a table shown as gender, as female and male in the columns, and cholesterol as high or normal in the rows, you see the actual descriptive numbers that were present in this uh, particular uh, grouping. Uh, 
from that, then the uh, program, since this is uh, mostly done, as you're aware, with software programs these days, is literally done to compare the actual number of uh, uh, males and females in the different uh, cholesterol categories uh, compared to what the expected count would be theoretically if there was no difference. So from that then, the chi-square test allows us to statistically determine whether or not the differences between the categorical percentages in each cell are significant. So a difference in this case implies a relationship. The values of one variable have an influence on the values uh, of another uh, value. Now as we talked about last time uh, in more detail, again this is all part of just the introductory summary, uh, we do what's called hypothesis testing to look to see if there are differences and the way by convention the null hypothesis is usually set up in statistics is to suggest that there is no difference uh, amongst the variables that are being studied, in this case males and females with respect to total cholesterol status. We also set up then an alternative hypothesis which is that there is then a difference among males and females with respect to the total cholesterol. Using the chi-squared testing function, in this case a Pearson chi-squared, which is just a certain uh, type of chi-squared test, you come out with a value which when looked at specifically uh, is particularly important for a p-value less than 0 0.05 in this case. Now the p-value again pretty basic to a study of hypothesis testing and we went through it last time uh, in uh, the first biostatistics uh, module but in, in summary, the p-value is just the probability that the observed relationship occurred by pure chance alone. And while we generally in most articles use a convention of 0 0.05, there are times when you may see a p-value of 0.1 or 0 0.01 uh, or other numbers, but by convention most scientific data we look at in clinical medicine uh, most commonly uses uh, a p-value of less than 0. So when we see the p-value like this, in this case 0 0.044 or less than 0 0.5, what we say then is that the test statistic is below 0 0.05 and therefore we reject the null hypothesis. Another way it, you might say this conveniently is that there's less than a 5 out of 100 chance that these findings occurred by random alone. So with this particular finding then, uh, we go back to our hypothesis testing as we stated here and discussed already about the null and the alternative hypothesis. And because in this case the groupings of the categorical variates uh, showed a p-value of less than 0.5, then we reject the null hypothesis and we accept the alternative hypothesis, which is for some people sounds backwards. I mean it is what we sort of usually wanted to know that there is a difference uh, but this comes under the alternative hypothesis. So there is in fact a difference between males and females with respect to their total cholesterol status as looked at in categories of normal or high. Okay. The check to see where we're at. Um, the second area we again looked at last time, this is still review, was to look at t-tests. And now suppose we go back to our original data, which we'll show on the next slide, which has both males and females, but now looks at uh, the cholesterol level, not in the last column as a categorical variable of normal or high, but rather an actual continuous variable with the actual numeric number of the cholesterol as you see in, in column uh, second from the right, column four. When you look at that uh, grouping and ask yourself, we're comparing a categorical variable 
and we're now comparing a quantitative or numeric value to that, we use a t-test for that kind of assessment. Uh, so this allows us to statistically compare the means of the two uh, quantitative, excuse me, the two categorical groups. We again form a hypothesis. Uh, the null hypothesis is that males and females do not differ in terms of their clinical cholesterol levels as determined by the mean, by a number. Uh, and then the alternative hypothesis, of course, is the opposite, that there is, in fact, a difference. When one looks at the, uh, again, test output from the computer program, you see on the top the descriptive numbers, the gender, male and female for cholesterol, the number in the second column, the mean serum cholesterol, uh, 185 for males, 207 uh, approximately for females. And then uh, what you look for uh, in this difference here, as you see here, is the p-value. This is uh, currently labeled a two-tailed t-test because in performing the test we're not making the assumption that we know that males are, are higher than females or lower. So you have to take into account a two-tailed t-test to be able to determine uh, both situations where either may be higher or lower than the other. Uh, and when one does this uh, two-tailed t-test, the number, as you'll see, is 0 0.031, which is, again, going back to our uh, hypothesis testing, is, may I ask the, the audience, is this uh, going to reject the null hypothesis? Yes, it, we reject the null hypothesis because the p-value is less than 0 0.05, and therefore we accept the alternative hypothesis. So this t-test on this data that we have again tells us that males and females do differ in terms of their clinical numeric cholesterol values or the mean of the group values. Okay. The other part of this we talked about last module was uh, the confidence intervals. And uh, again in simplistic forms the confidence intervals usually using the 95 percent term basically tell us that if we were to run this group of this type of test on a set of patients like we just looked at a hundred times 95 out of those 100 times the answer would fall between a minus 43 lower cholesterol for men to a minus 2% lower, or 2, I'm sorry, that's a actual value. Um, the, the number currently is 22%. So the 185 is 22% less than the 207. But if you ran this test and ran it and you took this same group of, how many is it, uh, 42 subjects out of a whole large population and you did that 100 times, 95 out of those 100 times it would fall between minus 43 and minus 2. What you particularly want to look for is that the confidence intervals don't cross 0. Okay, because if they cross 0 that would mean that on, in the 95 confidence intervals there are times when there actually is no difference between the two groups or if the confidence intervals cross 0 enough to the positive side, it may actually be telling you that if you did this study over and over and over again, sometimes the men would be more than the women, and sometimes the women more than the men. So that's somewhat simplistically, but in essence tells you what additional information you can gather from the 95% confidence intervals. Well, that was all by way of review of chi-squared and t-test a little bit on confidence intervals and of course hypothesis testing. Now the new information that uh, we want to present tonight which which uh, occurs in the categories as noted here ANOVA or analysis of variance, correlations, uh, and then epidemiological um, data interpretation. So we've talked already about two different situations comparing one categorical variable to another categorical variable. 
and we would do a chi-squared test, correct? Or one categorical variable with one numerical a type of variable or continuous variable, and that would be a t-test, okay? Now we need to look at a situation where we have one numerical value uh, and one categorical value, but it has three or more groupings, okay? So you have to look at this slightly differently. Here's an example where we're looking at the potential relationship between age at onset of breast cancer in women and different race categories, uh, in this case represented by white, African American or black, Hispanic, or Asian, as you see in the two columns in front of you. Again, we form a hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that there is no difference among racial groups with respect to the age at onset of breast cancer. And as always, that means we have an alternative hypothesis, which is that there is a difference, which is what we're looking for. In this case, the output from the statistical analysis of these multiple categories uh, is shown here with the descriptive statistics. It gives you the number in each group, the mean age at onset, the standard deviation from the mean, standard error, etc. When you actually look and do an ANOVA test on these sets of information, what you find is that there actually is a f number that comes out and from that number you then get a you get a p-value. Uh, this number is um, based upon a um, analysis of the numbers in each of the groups uh, combined and again because the p-value in this case is less than 0 .0001 uh, according to this output, uh, we reject the null hypothesis. So there is a difference among racial groups with respect to age at onset of breast cancer. Now, doing an ANOVA test simply tells you that the findings are not random, are not likely to be random, but it doesn't tell you which of the categories actually differs from the other. So what happens is that often uh, scientists will do what are called post hoc comparisons. Once they have a ANOVA test done which shows that the null hypothesis has been rejected and there is a difference between the several groups, they then go back and do individual comparisons using t-tests or other tests to look at the situations like we explored a few minutes ago where you're looking at only one category or um, uh, and not all of them together. So if you look at this um, here, let me get my interestingly what you find is that uh, there is some interesting finding and it really shows up here best probably in that the biggest difference amongst these different groups in the age of onset of breast cancer appears to be, you have to excuse me as I get the cursor here, uh, between Asian women and Caucasian women. And that's the same of course just reversed here in this category with Asian compared to white and you see it also is point zero zero zero. This is the same group of course just determined by which uh, group here is the independent variable. But what it tells me is that, that that group is particularly strongly different uh, and you could explore that with their their means. Uh, you, you note for example the mean here is dramatically uh, uh, large uh, in number compared to some of the other compar com comparator groups. Uh, but there is another group that's significant, right? So for example Asian women appear to also uh, be significantly uh, different from African American or black women in the age of onset of breast cancer because their p-value also falls below 0 0.05. Okay, so actually in this group that we looked at with four different categories, there are at least likely two groups that differ from each other, Asians and whites and Asians and African Americans both
probably statistically differ from each other in their average age of onset with it appears the impact being more between the Asian and the white uh, categories. I want to mention now uh, about comparison of two or more numerical variables. Okay, this is a, a new category that we're now exploring. Uh, and here we look are looking at uh, what are called correlations and correlation coefficients. The correlation coefficient or the R value uh, would range from negative one for a perfect negative correlation between two uh, groupings, numerical groupings, and a uh, correlation coefficient of plus one for a uh, perfect positive correlation with zero in the middle, of course, being exactly perfectly no correlation. Uh, the, these show up better, of course, in, in graph form. Here are two measurements uh, on each of the graphs uh, numerically uh, uh, shown here. And you can see that the, um, the dots, the data points, uh, appear to vary in these different graphs. Uh, in fact, in some cases, such as the, the third graph, it may be hard to even know whether or not there's any relationship just looking at it because of the scatter uh, of the points. But when you actually uh, put into a program that can measure the uh, correlation coefficients, uh, you can see here the actual uh, numbers for the R or correlation coefficient. And note, uh, comparing the bottom two uh, graphs, uh, how the tightening up of the data uh, closer around that correlation coefficient actually increases the R or the correlation coefficient over the bottom left graph that has approximately the same look to it but more scatter away from the from the uh, regression uh, curve or regression line excuse me another thing I would mention here is that um, when dealing with um, numerical values, two numerical values that you're going to look at a correlation coefficient, you have to be care careful about outliers because they, one outlier or two outliers that are dramatically different from the other data can have a quite dramatic effect on the correlation coefficient. Uh, and this is a whole area in and of itself is how to deal with outliers in numerical data. That's, uh, we'll save that for another another time if we have a part three. So in, in uh, looking at correlation coefficients, uh, in this case several examples, height and weight, uh, average number of cigarettes per day, and the age of onset of lung cancer, etc., you'll see that you're actually looking at two things. One is to see if with all of this, these uh, dots, all this data that is um, from numerical um, data, uh, there is a significance in their relationship, and that's the p-value. So you see that the top one, for instance, the uh, height and weight in humans in this study has a slightly significant p of 0 0.049, so it's statistically significant at a p of 0 0.05, uh, and, and it has a very high correlation coefficient. So not only is it significantly related in a positive way, uh, but that relationship, that correlation is very strong, 0.88. Uh, in the second one, uh, the significance of the number of cigarettes per day and the average age of onset of lung cancer is also significant. You see a P of 0 0.002, but note the correlation coefficient is much lower. So there's much more uh, scatter, you may say, or less of a strong correlation between those two numbers uh, in that population, even though there is a statistical significance. And in the third one, the number of diabetes medications and the patient's age, you'll note that while it appears that there's a correlation coefficient that seems fairly strongly positive, it's not statistically significant. It has a p-value of 0.1 uh, here in the particular uh, study looked at. We're now going to turn for the rest of the time to talking about several epidemiological measures. Uh, we're going to start with a fairly simple but important uh, definition and examples of sensitivity and specificity. 
Uh, the most important aspect of these tests to remember is that these are intrinsic qualities of the test itself, uh, as opposed to the predictive values, which we'll talk about a minute in a minute, which looks at a particular quality of a test in a particular population. That's a key difference. So starting with sensitivity and specificity, that we're going to determine from that uh, analysis uh, the um, true positives, the true negatives, false positive, and false negatives. Again, for most of you, this is probably review from, from medical school or uh, in your residency. So sensitivity is just the probability of a positive test among patients who have a disease. In the uh, two by two table here that's in front of you, that simply equates to A over A plus C. So the test is positive A over all patients that have the disease, which of course is the first column A plus C. The specificity is the probability of a negative test among patients without disease. So in this case, it's D, uh, the bottom right-hand uh, corner um, number, where the test is negative over all patients who don't have disease, which is, again, this, the right-hand vertical column of B and D. So use a specific example, which is always better than just blank numbers. Uh, let's look at screening for prostate cancer. This is uh, from a study, and the numbers, again, are uh, placed in the appropriate boxes for uh, the uh, appropriate uh, uh, PSA uh, test and the patients who had prostate cancer and who did not. And you see the numbers there. Okay, so when one looks and puts the uh, numbers together, you'll see that across the row we had 1,769 patients who did have a positive PSA, 13,147 that did not have a positive PSA. In this large body of almost 15,000 total patients, 78 ended up having prostate cancer in that first column, and 14,836 ended up uh, without disease. So to get the sensitivity and specificity is simply filling in the numbers that uh, were in the previous slide. Sensitivity A over A plus C means that the prostate-specific antigen uh, had a um, sensitivity of 0.73, probability of a pro positive test among patients who did have prostate cancer, and specificity D over B plus D, which ended up to be 0.88, which is the probability of a negative test among patients without disease. Okay, and this again is the original uh, numbers that we showed. Okay. Now, as opposed to sensitivity and specificity, the predictive value is uh, a determination that takes into account the particular population that's being studied as well as the actual test intrinsic qualities. So this is important uh, a difference uh, in understanding their importance for uh, evaluating a study. The positive predictive value in this case using the same kind of two by two chart which we'll show again in a moment uh, is the probability of disease among patients with a positive test. So in the uh, case of the group just looked at, okay, we have 57 over 57 plus 1712, which is uh, now looking horizontally rather than vertically. And that comes out to 0 0.032. Uh, that, in essence, is a much more helpful number because you can then use that to tell your patient uh, if they are similar in characteristics to the population that you're studying that this test has been looked at, uh, that if they have a positive PSA test, their chance of having prostate cancer is 1 in 30. Okay, so the positive predictive value of a positive PSA test in this population is 1 in 30, 0 
uh, a negative predictive value, in this case D over C plus D. Again, the probability of no disease among patients with a negative test, in this case, is 0 0.998. So one could say in this particular situation, again, of a practical value, that if you get back a negative prostate-specific antigen, a PSA, you can let your patient know with a high degree of certainty that they do not have prostate cancer. But if you get back a positive test, it's about 1 in 30, approximately. So it doesn't mean that they have it. It's just dramatically different from those that don't have a uh, positive PSA. Okay, and so again, these are the um, properties of the um, sensitivity and specificity as opposed to the predictive value based upon a population. Now, lastly, we're going to talk about two different measures of effects. Up until this time, uh, under the epidemiology section, we've been talking about uh, the accuracy of tests uh, in, of, in and of themselves or in a particular population. Now we're going to look at two tests that are commonly used that are uh, methods to determine the importance or the significance of exposure or disease. When doing this kind of uh, assessment, again, you can use a two-by-two two table to come up with similar types of, um, uh, of data. Uh, in this case, we're going to look at relative risk, uh, which is the risk of disease in people that have been exposed to a certain factor. Uh, this uh, could turn out to be uh, an increased risk, but it also could turn out to be a decreased risk, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but the risk of disease in those that are exposed over the risk of disease in those that are unexposed is the relative risk and is defined as noted at the bottom of the slide by A over A plus B divided by C over C plus D. Uh, with that equation, let's use a specific example, which is always better. This uh, is a 2 by 2 table that looks at the relative risk for people who use cell phones and the risk of car accidents. Okay, uh, You'll see those uh, car accidents uh, positive and negative in the columns at top and the cell phone usage or not in the rows uh, next to it to the left. When you put in the numbers for those particular statistics uh, that you see uh, present, what you come out with is that using a cell phone is about four times as likely to result in a car accident as not using a cell phone. Okay, just simply filling in from the population, uh, in this case a fairly large population of almost 30,000 people uh, that they surveyed and then had data on their um, having a car accident or not. Now, relative risk is usually used when you have a large data set, a large population that you can study. But frequently, particularly when we do uh, a type of study called a case control study, the numbers are much smaller and the population studied is a smaller sample of the real universe. Now, since you don't have the whole universe of people and you don't know the actual prevalence of disease in that larger hypothetical population uh, under, under the um, uh, confines of a case control study, we often use what's, what are called odds ratios. And odds ratios um, are often fairly similar to uh, the relative risk, uh, but there are some, some limitations. Looking again at how to determine it, it's actually slightly simpler than the equation used for relative risk. Uh, it's simply A over C divided by B over D. Uh, looking at the, the patients as set up here who had disease and didn't have disease on the top and the exposure or no exposure uh, on the, uh, in the rows on the left-hand side. Now in this case, the way that the data is set up uh, is, gives us an interesting result. When you figure out the data, the odds of, we'll call it disease, are actually 0.48 or about half 
okay, for this exposure as for those that did not have exposure. So while the data came out less than one, and you might be wondering why could that be, think about it in the light of the exposure actually having a protective effect. So for example, if you were doing a case control trial of wearing a bicycle helmet as the exposure, or wearing a seat belt as the exposure, and the uh, actual um, di patients with disease, if you will, are the adverse event, like a bicycle accident or a injury from a car accident, you actually come out with an odds ratio that may be less than one because the intervention, the seat belt, the bicycle helmet, is actually protective. Okay. Now, if we were studying the impact of um, uh, a, a medication or an environmental toxin on risk of cancer, we would expect to more likely see a positive above one odds ratio, correct? Uh, but in this case, it just turns out that the example used is, um, is actually protective. I wanted to throw that in to make it clear that you could have a odds ratio or relative risk of less than one. So uh, that concludes the uh, presentation tonight, which covered uh, a little bit of a part one uh, from last time and included some additional new elements of ANOVAs, clinical correlations, and some epidemiological tests such as um, the sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, uh, relative risks, and odds ratio. So having learned all this, what do you think the probability is that we're at the end of the talk for tonight? You got it. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you very much.